nothing but what influenced me the most was that my parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and older cousins were not allowed an education by law. I, I, I worked very hard. I'm not a natural born learner. It doesn't come to me easily. I graduated fourth in my high school class and cum laude in my undergraduate, as, as an undergraduate. And I remember my senior advisor as an undergraduate said, Hannah, how did you get so such good grades? And I said, I'm a tank. If I have to read a chapter 10 times, I will do it. That writing is a way of recording memory. It's not just history. It's a way of recording our most inner thoughts. Nelson Mandela, the first black prime minister of South Africa, said, education is the only key to changing the world. And I totally agree with him. In fact, I like to tell my students, a mind is a gift not to be wasted. I have been teaching writing at City University at different branches for over 30 years. I used to be full-time at Hunter, now I'm semi-retired. Many people ask me, why teach writing in this age of computer wizardry. So I ask my students the same question. And many of them come up with, what is writing? And I ask them, well, I don't know, what is it? And I say, I agree with, in, in some ways with them. Of course, I'm trying to elicit the response I want to hear. With tape recorders, iPhones, iPods, iPhones, iPads, you name it, it's electronic. Why continue to teach writing? And we talk about writing throughout the ages, and students finally come up with the answer, at least some of them do, and some of them don't, that writing is a way of recording memory. It's not just history. It's a way of recording our most inner thoughts. And they've done many studies that keeping a journal helps people to become healthier, even people with cancer. And they keep a journal. It helps them to be more focused on which lab tests to get what doctors to call. But I'd like to get back to my 30 plus years of teaching at CUNY and the joy that I have from it. I love my work, I'm truly blessed. And working with thousands of students over the years has given me the greatest pleasure. I try to get my students to be independent learners and independent writers. And the way I do this is they're very free to write about many topics, they're very free to do extra credit projects, and I've had some of the most wonderful experiences in my life with students writing and demonstrating what it is they're writing about, if possible. So what I do is I assign within a framework of a narrative or uh, an autobiographical essay or a classification essay, I try to assign the students total freedom to choose what topics they'd like to write, in, write about within that genre. I insist that students revise their drafts, revise their essays with at least one draft. And I also insist that before they give me an essay, they have copy edited, read it, on, read it not on the computer, but with a ruler, a pencil, or some instrument so that they read it line by line before they give it to me and that they read it out loud. I don't want students to be a victim. I want students to be a victor. In other words, I want them to be able to catch their own errors. There's nothing more empowering than a student who knows he or she has very few errors on a paper and that he or she has figured out what are strong points or weak, her strong points or weak points in writing. I read a book by Mina Shaughnessy many years ago called Errors and Expectations. She analyzed thousands of students' essays and in it, she said, because of this study, she found that students only make two or three kinds of errors over and over again. I didn't believe her. I'm a cynic. So I read hundreds of students' entrance exams, and I found that I came to the same conclusion. So therefore, if a student makes a mistake in grammar, spelling, punctuation, an awkward sentence, 
he or she must retype that on the draft. So a draft, a revised draft, consists of the new essay typed, the old essay on the bottom, and in the middle, their error pattern. All I have to do is see a, a student's essay two or three times, and I know the error pattern. But I want the students to empower themselves so they become victors, not victims, and they are be able to correct their error patterns. I love working with students. I just love to see them make progress. And I like to talk to them as a live human being, so I don't give out my email address, which I hardly use myself. I give them my home phone number and a cell phone number, and I'm so thrilled when they call me with a problem in their writing, or a personal problem, I'm not a psychoanalyst, and we work out some kind of deal how they can hand in their papers late. I not only am a writer, writing teacher, I'm also a writer. My late husband and I edited a small newspaper, and it, my other writing I share with my students. They don't know I've written an essay or a story or a poem. I give it out and I ask them to critique it. And they're very good critics, from the Greek word kritis to judge. And when I tell them I wrote it, many of the students go, uh-oh. She's going to give me a D because I criticized her in a negative fashion. And I said, oh, no. And I tell them how many drafts I did. I've even showed them one of the published articles that was published in a journal for English professors. And I tell them I did 30 drafts of it. They are absolutely amazed because they think I have some magic formula. But it really brings me down up to their level and down to their level for them to see my writing and problems that I have with it. We share a common goal. Nobody writes a perfect essay. In fact, I like to say the only people who write perfect essays are in the cemetery. I also hold myself very much accountable in the classroom I, because they, they expect me to be perfect and they expect me almost to be arrogant. And I try to show them that I make mistakes all the time and all, everybody does. It's not a crime to make a mistake. It's a crime not to try to correct it. Every time I make an error in class, whether in speech, something I put on the board, something I write on their papers, some piece of information I hand out, I get charged a dollar. I have a student in the class who's a bookkeeper. And towards the middle of the end of the semester, I say, what do I owe the class? The students say, my $50, $150, whatever it is. And what I try to do with that money, it's not given to the students, go to Atlantic City, what I do is I purchase everyday items to help them be better students that are very inexpensive, such as index cards, one of the finest tools ever invented, post-it notes, pens, the New York Times. Some semesters I even give out a brand new book to each student that I've purchased. I had a student once, she came to me to go over an essay. She had more electronic equipment than a dog has fleas. I said to her, you need to work on your vocabulary. She flashed an, an iPhone uh, that was so complicated I thought it could scramble eggs every morning. And she said, oh, I have an app for that. I said, your spelling is weak. She said, I have an app for that. I said, your sentence structure is weak. She said, I have an app for that. And I said, I hate to use a foul language, but your apps your app is a piece of crap. What you need to do is what I call gut work, sweat work. She did five revisions of the essay, and they it took hours for the, she and I to go over it, for her and I, rather, for her and me to go over it. See, I just corrected myself. But she wound up with an A, and I just saw her at a wedding, and she was so excited about that A, she still remembers, and she was just accepted into a nursing program. I cannot tell you how much, that, how much it means to, for me to see my students all over the city. Uh, state, many of them are so successful. One of my students that I keep in touch with constantly had terrible problems writing an essay. He took my class twice. He went on to the next class. I tutored him. And he finished his two-year nursing degree, his four-year nursing degree, and he's now a physician's assistant at Sloan Kettering. Another one of my students is a dentist. Another one of my students 
graduated this past semester at uh, New York City Tech, where I teach two courses. He was the valedictorian of his class as, as, as in the nursing program, and he's going on for his four-year degree, and he's going to go on to medical school. I just know it. Um, yes. I cannot tell you the joy I find. I keep repeating myself. Uh, one, I ran into one of my students, and um, she said she worked at the police department to pay the bills, but she writes plays, and her plays have appeared in church basements in Y auditoriums, and she said I inspired her to do this. In addition to giving out, uh, to, to admitting to my mistakes and buying the students post-it notes, index cards, pens, newspapers, and books as penalties for making mistakes, I let my students challenge my grade. They are shocked by that because they said no instructor or high school teacher or elementary school ever to do that. And I say a grade is not a punishment. And I'm a human being and I make errors. Suppose I, was, suppose I were in traffic on the Long Island Expressway. And afterwards, I, when I reached my destination, I graded their papers. Why should, I, why should they be penalized? Because I sat in traffic for two hours and mumbled and grumbled to myself. <laughs> so I let my students challenge my grade three ways. Because life is about challenges and how we meet them. They, can, they must revise their papers at least once. But if they're going to challenge my grade, they have to revise the paper at least twice with the sentence corrections and a new, fresh new copy on top, old copy on the bottom. They can challenge me by making a clean copy without their name on it. We hand it out to the class. The class decides. Now let's say I give, gave the paper a C and the class gives it an F. My C counts. The higher grade always counts. That way students don't feel that if they challenge me, my personality is going to get in the way and the, how dare you challenge me. Another technique I use is they can ask me to show it to another instructor and the instructor writes comments and gives it a grade. If I gave the paper a C and another instructor gives, gives it an A, the A counts. Uh, a third technique, which I've just instituted, I'm so excited about this in the last two semesters, is the student writes up a proposal, point for point, what he thinks is positive about his paper, what is negative about his paper, and how my positive and negative criticisms were correct or not correct. And I had one student this semester who, who was, his writing was fantastic when he challenged my grade. And I gave, uh, changed his grade, and I gave him an A-plus on the challenge. And he was amazed by that. And I said, why are you amazed? Life is, is coming to terms with something. Life is about learning. Life is about revising. And you made me reread your essay again. And point for point, although I disagreed with some of the points, you had a very good argument. And I changed your grade and, and the 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 the, the, the your objections to my grade or the proposal was just outstanding. I mean, the lawyer would be amazed by it. So I'm just thrilled I let students challenge my grade because I don't want a grade to be a punishment. I also believe writing tests should never be timed. I don't think Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet in an hour and 15 minutes, but I guess I'm outdoing the time limit here. <laughs> And that's a point for another day. I've been arguing with the people at CUNY for almost 40 years about that. Because the CUNY writing math test is untimed, the reading test is untimed, but the writing test is timed. And one of my favorite books is Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, who wrote about growing up black in America. And that book took him 20 years to write. I don't think an hour and 15 minutes is enough time to write an essay, but I'll stop at this point. I'll keep arguing till they put me in the ground. I was born and raised in a little town called Freehold, New Jersey. Um, I think that what influenced me the most was that my parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and older cousins were not allowed an education by law. They were born in Eastern Europe, Russia, and Poland at the turn of the century. When minorities, whether political minorities, religious minorities, were not allowed to attend the schools. And my inspiration was uh, two of my, I, they were older cousins, but I called them my aunts, grew up in a little village in Russia, which was so backwards that when somebody came on a bicycle, the people thought it was a devil. 
and my two aunts ran away from home because they didn't like the maxim. They ran away when they were young, they were older teenagers, that a woman's place was in bed, in church, or in the kitchen. And they wanted to learn to read and write, and there were no opportunities. So they ran away to a big city in Russia, but their father came and got them because he thought they would become prostitutes if they stayed in the city. Also, my father was a great inspiration. I'm sorry, should I not talk about this to me? Yes, go ahead. All right, because he and my mother and my aunt and uncle lived, when they came to this country, they lived in one room in Canada, and they worked in a fur factory. And believe me, there were no unions, and the conditions there were very primitive, but they saved every penny, opened up little businesses, and worked seven days a week, practically round the clock, so that their children would have an educational opportunity. And but my father worked in a store, eventually owned his own little store. And when he would eat his lunch, which took about 10 minutes or 15 minutes, he would stand in the back and read a book, because that was so precious to him. Um, he taught himself to read and write. And that left an impression on me that I will never forget. And I'm proud to say that all of us in one generation are all professionals, either doctors, lawyers, professors, social workers. And it's a result of our parents sacrificing everything so that we can get an education. And I love this country for the freedoms it gives and the fact that so many people have an, uh, an opportunity to get an education, whether they're 70 years old. CUNY has a program for senior citizens. They can take up to five courses for $80. I was such a serious child that I can't think of anybody else. <laughs> I was always worried about my grades and learning, and I've always been a fairly serious person. I, I was a loner because I, I questioned so many aspects of life as a very young age, and I was always a, a thinker. I always wanted to be a teacher. Yes. I, I, and I worked very hard. I'm not a natural born, it doesn't come to me easily. I graduated fourth in my high school class and cum laude from my undergrad, as, as an undergraduate. And I remember my senior year advisor as an undergraduate said, Hannah, how did you get so such good grades? And I said, I'm a tank. If I have to read a chapter 10 times, I will do it. So. Actually, everybody in my family, well, two out of my three brothers majored in history, so I did too. But I'm very grateful for the, gradu for the education I received in elementary school and high school. Uh, we had to memorize the Warrener's Grammar book by the time we were in high school. <laughs> it just became part of me. And I can't remember how it happened, oh, uh, how I fell into t teaching English. But I think it, it was just something, because of my knowledge of grammar, uh, it's sort of, I, you know, I can't even remember exactly how it happened. I've been in this game so long that I don't know when, how it happened, really. Not. Would have cried. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I'm such a lover of books and learning. Uh, I can't imagine doing anything outside of this. I mean... I love to go to lectures, I love to go to museums, where I'm on a guided tour, I love to watch documentaries, I love to memorize obscure facts, I mean Trivial Pursuit is, is one of my favorite games. I live in the world of the mind, and I can't imagine not doing that. Good teaching, non-teaching. I don't really teach my students anything. The teaching and learning comes from them. I think uh, one of my oh, I know one of my favorite stories when I was full time. Um, somebody, a state auditor, came to the classroom, and he wanted to see if the state money's using. And one of the many colleges I've taught, and if the money was 
were being used wisely. He went back to my chairwoman and he said, what kind of a college is this? There was no instructor in the room. So my chairwoman said, well, what was going on in the room? Oh, the students were working very diligently. There was one person in the room who was very tall with glasses and very short hair, and she kept moving around and working with students, but I didn't know if she were a student or a tutor or what. Where was the professor? And my chairwoman <laughs> smiled, chuckled to herself, and said, that's Hannah. She says non-teaching is the best type of teaching, and Hannah always worked on an individual basis. She did not give group lessons unless the entire class were having a problem. Yeah. The students at many of the CUNY campuses I've taught at write anonymous evaluations. It's not just a checklist. And they all said that the individual work and the revising their essays with my help on an individual basis helped them the most. So that's why I continue to work on an individual basis. I mean, I can walk into a room and lecture on a play by Shakespeare or an essay by um, Langston Hughes, one of my favorite writers, for, an hour, for three hours. But that doesn't really help anybody, you know, unless the person is involved, the student is involved. And I'm a student of writing. I always tell my students they're shocked by that, especially after they read my essays and offer positive and negative criticism. drastic changes. Uh, we, we are living now in a global economy. I mean, uh, India is as close to me in, in, uh, by computer uh, two seconds. And we're now competing on a level that was, that's unheard of in the history of mankind. And I think we have to bring back the three R's. I think that the public schools need extensive discipline, extensive after-school programs, and education should be our most important product. I think the saddest commentary about people in prison is many of the pe most of the people there cannot read or write. I'm not saying we can solve all the problems in the world, but when people are given a chance to get an education, their entire outlook changes, even with our disastrous economy. Absolutely. I mean, I would make schools 11 and a half months a year. I would make the day longer. I would up the standards and, you know, improve the standards. And I once attended a lecture at Hunter many years ago. I don't remember the speaker. But somebody did a study on schools that are very successful, academically, socially, emotionally, and they have nothing in common. Some were located in areas of extreme poverty. Some were located in areas of extreme wealth. So the researcher tried to find what these schools had in common, that they had high graduation rates, that the students went on to succeed in some field. And she found out that the common factor, the three common factors were the parents were involved, the administration was involved, the staff was involved, and the students were involved. In fact, she found a school somewhere in upstate New York in a terrible, terrible neighborhood. High crime, I mean, just horrible. But the parents, the teachers, the staff, and the students all worked together. And the students put together a curriculum whereby in the morning they learned academic subjects, geography, math, physics. And in the afternoon, they ran an actual newspaper. They ran an actual mini bank. They ran an actual mini uh, uh, stock market. And the parents, many of them who just barely earned enough to put food on the table, were involved. If some parent painted houses, he would come to the school and paint the school. If a mother worked as an all-night waitress or a cook in a restaurant, she would come to work in the cafeteria. The parents were so involved, even though many of them hardly got any sleep at night, and were barely able to pay the rent on a studio apartment with living a single mother with three children. And I believe that's the common factor. When everybody works together, the school works. Okay. So. I find it's not so much that, it's a general idea. I mean, I once wanted some students to come in, it was final exam time, and some students had missed the final exam with 
good excuses, and I wanted to use the teacher's faculty room. And the teachers were appalled. They said, go use a classroom. I mean, I think our students are our most important product. And uh, for instance, I've been to some colleges that have excellent uh, DVD, VHS collections. And the faculty, we, as a member of the faculty and my other colleagues, we are allowed to take them out and use them at home, but students are not. It's like Macy's saying, I'm sorry, customers can't come in here all day long. I mean, my students are my most important product. They should have more privileges than I do, the campus. I, I just find that, that everybody has to realize that the students are number one. Okay. Yes. I mean, I can't be specific, but I, I just think that the students deserve every privilege. They have to have every obligation, but they deserve every privilege. They're, they're, they're number one. I can only tell you that, that uh, I can only give you an example of uh, the Macaulay program at City University now, yes? which is a marvelous honors program founded by a Mr. Macaulay, who was a very poor boy. And I think he mentioned I was 10 or 20 stops to get to, I think, to City College, the campus he went to. And he became a billionaire, and he credits his time at, C at City College at 137th Street and Convent Avenue with giving him that chance. And then CUNY was free. And I can't tell you how many people I've seen even with the low tuition at CUNY, that it has changed their lives. They could not have afforded to come here. It has changed their lives, and these people have gone on to become productive citizens. In fact, I think CCNY, I'm sorry, it's uh, City College on 137th and Convent, has something like almost a dozen Nobel Prize winners, and none of them came into that school when they were rich. So I think that that's a very important opportunity. I, I think that why many Asian countries, uh, um, I read an, an essay in the Times about a young woman who lives in a grass hut somewhere in North Vietnam. She gets up at three in the morning and walks two miles to school. I think Americans have gotten lazy. And, 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 and in other countries, people are hungry. And when people are hungry, they are very motivated. I just want to say that if you, that you do not speak English, uh, I don't know if it's still on television, but uh, Channel 13 had a program sponsored by Con Edison uh, for people to pass the high school equivalency. Also was on Channel 13, the man, man who invented the chocolate chip cookie, uh, created the chocolate chip cookie line. Uh, they had programs there for people to learn. Uh, I don't know if they still exist. Call your local library. Your local public library will know about ESL classes. And... Uh, when I'm teaching, I do everything to let my students know what's available for their relatives. And if I, when I go to a library, and I'm in the library three, four, five days a week, my public library, the community libraries, whatever, uh, I pick up flyers and always give them out to the students. I am always pick. I get sometimes I've had the head of counseling come to my class at City Tech to speak to the students. I'm always giving any kind of information I see on television, um, at the offices where I teach, or anywhere about something of interest. Um, uh, to get back to my own teaching, <laughs> I love to help my students work on a project. In fact, I even tell them that I'll be glad to w work with them long after they've graduated, just call me. And I've had some students do some unusual projects. Many of them were flustered by them. Um, one student, she was 19, she was from China, and uh, I, I, I do this to encourage my students to ask me for help, and I try to teach them what's available. And she had to, she took a course on World War II, and she had to find uh, someone who survived World War II, not just a soldier, but a refugee, a concentration camp victim. So there were two Holocaust victims in my neighborhood, and I arranged for this young woman my student, to come and interview them. And it was a marvelous, you know, she did a lot of research. Another time a student came to me, she had to do a paper on someone who was in the Vietnam War 
And my brother, who's a retired history professor from Montclair State University, was a soldier there. So I had her interview him on the phone, and then he wrote her a letter. Um, I try to, I would suggest to immigrants to ask everybody they know and, and go to their local public officials, whether it's the local political club, their local library, their local police station, yes? And um, look, look at what's on the bulletin board. Uh, yes, everything's on the internet, but I'm a big bulletin board person. And also, get your local newspapers that people take for granted. Uh, Warren Buffett uh, is my hero, and he just bought a group of local newspapers. And he said that they serve a tremendous pu public, but not what the New York Times, the Daily News, and the New York Post, and the Wall Street Journal, etc. Uh, they're fine newspapers, but go to your local newspapers. And I do that myself, even though I read three or four national and international newspapers every day. Because if I want to find a knitting class, or a part-time job for a friend, okay, or a local exercise class, or a marching band parade, which I love, that will be in the local newspapers. Check your local newspapers, the throwaway newspapers that are in the lobby of a library, a supermarket. They have fantastic information for a neighborhood, which an international national newspaper they do not carry that kind of information. And just ask and try. And I would like to recommend LaGuardia Community College for Immigrants. It has a fantastic ESL department, LaGuardia Community College. And I would like to recommend CUNY. It's just wonderful. And I know with all the students I've taught over 30 years, uh, one of my students, students graduated with honors in the nursing program. When she came to me, English was not her native language. I mean, she was very ambitious and hardworking, but um, CUNY is a fantastic place, and it gives so many people an opportunity. And there I go back to my free or inexpensive education. And uh, you know, a mind is a gift not to be wasted, and to me, CUNY's greatest contribution is being to harvest those minds and put them to effective use, and the Macaulay program is just an example of a poor boy who was given a chance not just to make money but to give back as Mr. McCauley and his wife had. Giving me the opportunity to truly love the work that I do. Warren Buffett said, if you love what you do, you will never work a day in your life. And once again, I want to end with Nelson Mandela's quote, education is the key to changing the world. And I hope in one, some small way I've helped the thousands of students who have given me so much more than I've given them over my lifetime. Thank you.